Friends, please be seated. Today we get to spend some time with one of my favorite characters from all of the Bible. This guy, Nicodemus, he's close to my heart, possibly because he's also a priestly kind of religious dude. I'm just going to close this door. Oh, she's coming back. <laughs> Too bad that I didn't pretend like I had Jedi powers. Just, you got it. You, you're way ahead of me. Yeah, that was good. So as I was saying, Nicodemus. He thinks he's something special. (laughs) Nicodemus is one of those characters that I really love, not only because he is a religious authority, like this guy knows the Bible, the Hebrew scriptures, the Torah, inside and out. He's a teacher of Israel. He's the guy who knows. And yet... He gets schooled by Jesus, but that's not even the best part. The best part is he comes at night. He comes during the cover of night because he is afraid. He is afraid. He's afraid of what others might think of him, the other people in the religious establishment. He's afraid of what his followers, what his Talmudin, his students might think of him, consulting this itinerant rabbi who says these crazy things about topsy-turvy kingdom of God, heaven available to everybody. What? To everybody? I must know more. So he goes to Jesus. Even though it's a cover of night, he goes. He goes. This is the first lesson. So Jesus teaches him, once he gets there, that he must be born again. Now, the language in this scripture reading from this morning doesn't use the words born again, but I want to use them today because I want to grab that phrase that has been co-opted for so long to mean who's in and who's out. Have you, do you know the shibboleth? Do you know the secret handshake or not? and I'm going to yank it back and take it back. Because I am here to declare to you all today, friends, brothers, and sisters, I am born again! And again! And again, and again, and again, and again. And so are you. And that's the opportunity and the possibility and the potential that we have today on this second Sunday in Lent. Jesus tells him when he gets there that he needs to forget everything that he has learned. He needs to empty his cup so that it can be filled again. As a teacher of the law and a religious leader, he knows the rules backwards and forwards. He knows the ins and outs of the law and the prophets. He is an expert letter follower Jesus, though, is inviting him to become an expert in living in God's Spirit. Jesus is shifting the conversation from the choose life. He begins in the choose life that we heard two weeks ago. The katasarka, don't live in the flesh, but choose life. You're from Deuteronomy. And he's going from there back again to choosing life in the Spirit. What we call here choosing the with God life that goes farther back than the law and the prophets, goes beyond the, the, the readings that he would know. Jesus is revealing the very point of the law and the prophets here. It is the cosmic and ever practical Jesus that we love at his best. Jesus says to him that he must forget everything he's learned, move beyond understanding, move beyond knowledge and reason, and become like a little child, curious and full of wonder, moving beyond facts and tradition into the realm of experience and relationship. 
For those of you who were here at Adult Christian Formation today with Quentin, that should be ringing some bells. To do this, Nico has to empty his cup. He must let go and let God for all of my 12-steppers in this room. He must let go of being what Brene Brown calls a knower and become what she calls a learner. Now, knowers are folks whose cups are always full, often to overflowing. You know who you are. You're too busy, too overworked, and way overaccomplished. They are super busy people who often convince others that they can be trusted, that they know what they're doing by demonstrating binary thinking, overappreciating the subtlety and ambiguity of life. By choosing to be right, rather than allowing the space for questions and inquiry and admitting that they don't know everything about the situation or a person or the problem at hand. We, I mean, they, they slip into knower mode. And when we're in knower mode, look out. We would rather be fervently wrong than tepidly right. Hello, my name is George, <laughs> and I am a knower. This is our friend Nicodemus. Learners, on the other hand, choose to remain in the question, choose to remain in the inquiry. They do so in wonder at a person, at a circumstance, at a situation, even when to do so is hard and uncomfortable, and especially when it makes other people uncomfortable. Learners cultivate a curiosity about themselves and the world and try to reserve judgment until they know more or understand better or can find meaning in the midst of the challenge the ambiguity, or the not knowing. The learners can take a breath, listen to their own heartbeat, and wait for it. A still, small voice. This is at the heart of what it means to be still and know. This is Jesus. And by the way, my name is George, and I'm a complicated dude. I'm also a learner, and you might be complicated too. Jesus invites Nicodemus into just such a space, one where he doesn't have to have all the answers, one where it's not about being right or wrong. It isn't the point. A space where he can actually find what he's looking for. A space less about being reborn with a clean slate or being sinless or atoned than a space where his heart and mind and strength are transformed into a new creature, into the most Nicodemus he's ever been before. Unless he's able to move from knower to learner to empty his cup so that it can be filled again, to be born again, he's only putting new wine into old wineskins. He's only attempting to make great again that which wasn't so great to begin with. He's got to get out beyond what he already knows how to do just better. He needs to get to a space of being the kind of person who wonders what else God might be up to in this situation, in this moment, who wonders where God's third way might lead beyond his own schemes and beyond his own plans, somewhere beyond the power of his own effective will 
to become one who is willing to let go and let God, or at least just get out of the way. Now this is where we're going to dial it in just a little bit deeper. Here we have to be honest about how we participate in our new life, this new born-again life. We miss the point if we focus only on the forgiveness of sins, or what has come to be known as being born again, or are you saved? I can't tell you how many times I walked down Bruin Walk, and there was somebody saying, are you born again? Have you been saved? And they're like this, and I'm like this. <laughs> We've all had that experience because the focus has been so much on forgiveness of sins to the exclusion of the transformed heart and life that comes as a result of such lavish love and forgiveness and what we call grace. The transformed life through restored relationship with God is not so that we might be forgiven and then keep on experiencing the defeating, soul-crushing life of brokenness that we've always known. Not at all. Many Christians today miss the point of God's saving grace through Jesus, just like Nicodemus missed the point of the law. For many Christians, the point of all this has become not about living the abundant kingdom of God life that Jesus promises right here and right now, but rather about mitigating the consequences of the choices that we make which separate us from God. We do this through behavior modification, like outward avoidance of sinful acts. Oh, and we know how that works out. Even our dear St. Paul says, oh, I don't want to do the things that I hate, but I can't help myself. I do them anyway. That doesn't work out so well for us. Or we do it through confessing them after the fact. This avoiding and confessing through our failure of character and our best efforts to white-knuckle or otherwise by our own power to modify our outward behaviors always fail because we forget the key ingredient. Grace. We forget that God's key ingredient is God's transforming love doing for us that which we can never do for ourselves. There's no wonder why so many of us who desperately desire to have the with God life are discouraged over and over again. Because our religious teachings have so narrowly have so narrowed the activity of being born again or salvation to the forgiveness of sins alone to the exclusion of almost everything else, including the grace-saturated process of reshaping our inner lives to match to some substantial degree the character of the inner life of Jesus himself. Jesus says, you can be like me. He says, you can be like me. The lifelong process of formation into the full stature of Christ is what we call living heaven all the way to heaven. It's not only possible, it's the point. It's the point. It's no wonder Nicodemus, Nicodemus and m many folks' experience of life is something less than living a life caught up in the goodness and love and possibility of the new life Jesus promises. Being born again 
is more than a mindset or an attitude. Being born again is more than a one-off spiritual experience, more than a slogan, more than a bumper sticker, more than a secret handshake to determine whether you're in or you're out. Being born again and again and again and again and again is a relationship. It's a way of life. It is the way of the with God life that Jesus promises you. It is Jesus' way. You must be like a little child to enter the kingdom. Children have such a beautiful and easy way about them. They have such an easy way about being born again, don't they? Yeah. They're naturally curious, and they let things go like that. You see a toddler? You take his toy away? Oh my gosh, the stamping of the feet and the throwing themselves down on the ground and the crying and the wailing and all of that stuff. And then all of a sudden, a hummingbird comes in front of their face and to visit the flower and get some nectar and all of a sudden they're distracted and boom! Oh, the wonder of it all! They are easily born again and again and again and again. They're always ready to learn more. Kids are natural learners. Until they get the learner sucked right out of them. And then they have only one alternative. Protect, defend, conform, and attack. They become knowers. Otherwise known as adults. If this world is to be a better place, we need to cultivate more learners. To be filled, Nicodemus has to empty his cup. To be born again from above, we have to do the same. Empty ourselves of what we know or what we think we know. Empty ourselves of our tradition. Empty ourselves of all that we have known the data, the information about God, and settle for nothing less than an experience with the Almighty, with the ever-present, with the living God of love and grace, emptying ourselves so that we can be filled again, again, and again from above. And just like all of Jesus' teachings, this process, it sits in a lifelong process of being born again and again and again and again. This is not about the destination. I know that's a cliche, but it's so true. This is not about a destination. So you can take that off your checklist. It is about the journey with Jesus. It's not about getting it right or being right. It's about a journey. It's about a process. It's about a relationship with God in a life of grace and intention and hard work and joy. As Malcolm Geit writes in his Lenten Daily Meditations, the born-again life is not just a wistful one-off in an otherwise empty desert of our lives without God, but is richly available to us always and everywhere if we only have eyes to see and time to stop. This Lent, take time to stop, to be still.